how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos in our Patreon AMA session. So this November 2023 edition, we consider a very interesting question about the um, differences or maybe the surprising common ground between accelerationism and anti-tech philosophy. This is a part of the School of Fintechs. Remember, you can join us there. Submit your own questions for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Links to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts in the video description. We also begin with a disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. All right, so we'll begin by taking a look at the patron's question itself. The patron wrote, Hey Chad, I liked your latest appearance on BTR Podcast. That is uh, Break the Rules, by the way. Maybe a brainless question, but on the topic of anti-tech, just curious um, as to why you, for the most part, prefer the method of Kaczynski's out over Nick Lance through. Now, this is a great question, which um, really is referring to my latest uh, podcast appearance on Break the Rules about a month ago, in which I participated in a debate against Noah Smith, in which I represented, obviously, the anti-tech or tech pessimist position, and Smith represented the tech optimist position, or the idea that uh, more technological progress in the future will ultimately be good for humans, because um, as Smith describes technological progress as inherently humanistic in a recent blog post, the idea is that um, insofar as humanism means that there are no values except the ones that humans have willed into existence, if we interpret that in like a Nietzschean sense, um, it obviously follows that more technology will be good for us because we'll only will into existence those new values, which are, say, um, trying to solve problems which before would have been unsolvable. So this is something which, if you take an extremely hopeful position towards, um, will eventually lead to uh, computers solving things like death itself. And that may sound like, you know, hyperbole, but uh, people like uh, Ray Kurzweil are arguing exactly that because they understand technological progress, once again, in this extremely humanistic sense. So in contrast with that, which you guys know is obviously not my position. You seem to have two different choices, as this uh, question asks. You have the uh, method of Kaczynski's out, and you have the method of Nick Land's through. So right now we're just really dealing with prepositions, rather than um, the kind of uh, much longer labels you would otherwise give. You know, anti-tech philosophy and accelerationism are kind of more complicated ways of talking about it, whereas uh, this patron uh, very nicely uh, condenses it down to the prepositions. What's the difference between uh, getting out and going through? And the question is, what are those um, out of and through, because a preposition, if you teach grammar, as um, I uh, was a former teacher of grammar in America, you may not know, and I, I still am uh, teaching grammar uh, here in India, both in uh, German languages and also um, in giving it, uh, advanced lessons in English grammar, um, as a occasionally uh, guest lecturing at, at colleges here, um, the uh, preposition um, is inherently supposed to be connecting two things, right? If you diagram the prepositional phrase, you have the, the question of, well, obviously it's us who are either getting out or going through, but uh, what are we getting out of and what are we going through? And does this become a lot more tricky when you realize that for Nick Land, the other part of that is largely described as capitalism, whereas for Kaczynski, it's simply technology. And um, Kaczynski does not think that it's just a matter of calling this capital, whereas for Nick Land, that's a really big deal. So we're already in a fairly complicated position, and that's before we've even begun to consider all of the extra theoretical stuff we need to know about, say, Deleuze, to be able to talk about accelerationism. And really, that's the simplest answer here, is that um, the reason why I more often uh, bring up Elul and Kaczynski in especially debate contexts, like on Break the Rules, the most recent really with um, Noah Smith, is just that it's so much easier to do so in that particular context. Because in order to talk about Nick Land, um, you really need like a couple hours of lecturing um, on the foundations of the theory, even to begin to make sense of it. And so the simplest answer is that Kaczynski is so much easier easier to present without a lot of theoretical explanation up front because Kaczynski was specifically um, 
maximizing the readability and understandability of his ideas for the general population. It's not that Kaczynski didn't write academic papers for specialists. He obviously did when he was a mathematician, and that's why nobody reads them, or even can, as uh, his advisor at Michigan noted that his dissertation was so complicated, or so specialized is a better word, uh, that only about a dozen people in the country in that particular sub-sub-niche of pure mathematics could have read it. And that's exactly what Kaczynski didn't want to do when he was talking about anti-tech philosophy, uh, which he probably wouldn't have even used that way of describing it. This is just um, warnings to the population about what technology is doing to them, which he chose not to um, go down the path of writing super specialized academic literature on, but rather uh, went straight to, at that time, the megaphone to reach the most people, which in the 1990s was uh, major newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, etc. Now today, that megaphone is largely the internet, which is why I myself as somebody concerned about technology. I'm using YouTube despite the fact that I regularly get comments asking, well, if you're really anti-tech, why are you using a PowerPoint slideshow on a YouTube video? Well, the answer should be obvious. This is the way to reach people today. And because Kaczynski was also trying to reach everyone with this message, um, he found a way to describe um, the problem um, in a way that anyone could understand um, without watering down the... Um, theory itself, and that's why I'm more likely to bring to reference him in debates rather than Nick Land. But I, I actually do think that there is a common ground between accelerationism and anti-tech philosophy. It's just that that common ground is so complicated, you really have to give almost the full answer to it in a video of its own, which is what we're going to do today. Now, before we could talk about the common ground between anti-tech philosophy and accelerationism, we have to acknowledge a certain difference, a certain disagreement or discrepancy um, between these two before we have even left the uh, prepositional phrase which uh, this patron alludes to. So uh, the prepositional phrase out of and the prepositional phrase through obviously presuppose some other referent. And uh, the question really is what that other thing is. So for Kaczynski, it's obvious we have to get out of something. And for Nick Land, we have to go through something. But what is that other something? Well, even at this level, we already find a disagreement between the two. Because for Kaczynski, obviously, the thing we have to get out of is modern technology. And it's not capitalism for Kaczynski, because he made very clear that capitalism is just another surface level economic arrangement of a technological society. And communism is, at its most basic level, just that too. Communism is just a different superficial economic agreement over how to run a still modern technological society. You need modern technology for communism, even more so than for capitalism, because communism is more regulated it's, it has to be more predictable and is therefore less tolerant of really natural freedom. So upgrading from capitalism to communism is no upgrade at all for those who understand what's really going on. Therefore, obsessing over explaining away all the problems of modernity whatsoever as superstructural ideological reflections of capital um, is exactly not what Kaczynski finds useful. But in contrast, Nick Land does talk about capital. And what he says we have to go through um, is the capital, uh, uh, the capitalistic um, understanding of the problem, rather than placing all the emphasis on modern technology. So it would seem at the outset that there's no debate possible between these two. For Nick Land would just seem to be making the same mistake as Marxists or SJWs. Remember in 2020, it was also argued that we have to uh, accelerate the process. We have to suspend law and order for one summer to allow violent rioting, uh, to uh, force the global capitalist system to upgrade to a new phase in which all of the social problems which are parasitic upon it, like police racism that supposedly led to the death of George Floyd, even though he actually was killed by fentanyl overdose, which is a whole nother issue. But we accept the media narrative that um, police racism is just a um, parasitic, superstructural, uh, ideological reiteration of the economic base of capitalism um, we have to accelerate the process uh, by uh, forcing capitalism's contradictions to birth a phase transition to 
communism in which supposedly none of these problems would exist anymore. The transphobic refusal to accept the existence of no fewer than 68 genders, we were also told that same summer, uh, will also disappear if the uh, capitalist base it is parasitic upon um, goes away. Um, so we have a discrepancy here, it seems, um, even before we begin any debate between the two, because those are exactly the sort of thought errors which Kaczynski had already refuted at great length within his work by showing that um, obsessing over capitalism is actually useful to the system because uh, it never allows you to critique what's really at issue in the thing most important to us, which is the loss of freedom as specifically the destruction of nature as more and more of it is transformed into technology. So accelerating that would seem to be exactly what we don't want to do, because if you keep continue accelerating that conversion of nature into technology, the end point of that will just be um, a society of robots in which humans don't exist anymore. Even if uh, flesh and blood homo sapiens are still nominally there, they will eventually become so over-socialized, so conditioned to act only in those ways that the global technological system requires, that even if they're still literal flesh and blood homo sapiens, um, they're not really humans anymore. And we're actually quite close to that point already. The inability for um, entire um, subclasses of um, thinkers really to, um, to say anything except what the global technological system requires them to say is already robotized, um, say, every SJW within the academic industry. They no longer really create original ideas. Rather, they just find ways to promote the things the technological system already needs, like 68 genders, um, like a replacement of the police force that supposedly led to the death of George Floyd by a new police force. It's not that we don't want no police whatsoever. Defund the police was really about replacing that old and outdated police force that presupposed the liberal idea um, in the you know classical sense of the term, like the Thomas Jefferson sense of the term, um, of, of human rights to uh, private property uh, for everybody. No, no, no. The only rights we'll have in the future will be for those who've earned it through having the right social credit score. That's why law and order was temporarily suspended so that um, they could draft up a new system in which only certain people were allowed to do something as basic as leave their house. And uh, from Kaczynski's standpoint, we can obviously see this as more technology, which is exactly what we don't want, which is why we want to get out. But is Nick Land's position really as simple as saying we want to continue accelerating a process that's going to lead there, or is it much more complicated? So uh, it is true that uh, Kaczynski says we need to get out of technology, and Nick Land says we need to go through capital. But Nick Land's understanding of capital is something which is so complicated that you really need Deleuze to understand how, when he's talking about capital, he's really not doing the Marxist thing that you might be more familiar with. So before we can understand Nick Land's view of capital as being different from the caricatures I just brought up, we have to first go to Deleuze and Guattari um, to see how that multi-volume project they had called capitalism and schizophrenia um, allows us to understand capital very differently precisely through understanding the schizo first. So um, if we take Freud and Marx as two thinkers who are kind of deconstructed, if you will, within this work, we'll start with Freud by showing that Freud misunderstands desire by over-interpreting any manifestation of desire whatsoever through the structuration of the Oedipal Triangle. He over-interprets any manifestation of desire as really having to tell us something about the terms the mother, the father, and the child that had already been presupposed on kind of an a priori level even before you began the analysis. Well, Deleuze and Guattari kind of reverse this by showing that what appeared to be a priori is actually a secondary side effect. The um, Oedipal Triangle really tells us about... Um, the actual and identifiable, but doesn't tell us really about the virtual, which exceeds it asymmetrically. A full explanation of that, by the way, really can only be found um, through reading Deleuze, uh, Deleuze's A Difference and Repetition. But for the purposes of this video, we can say that for Deleuze, um, you do have actual and identifiable objects like, say, 
a coconut that you can hold in your hand, but um, the coconut uh, should not be thought of as a substance in the Aristotelian sense of the term, which is then fit under a small set of categorical headings like quality, quantity, relation, etc. For the substance you take for granted there is itself something which is maybe derived secondarily from things which are not anything like actual or identifiable objects. So what really interests us in holding a coconut, which we then attribute the secondary properties of being hairy and hard to, um, is not the fact that the coconut is a substance bearing those properties, which is the Aristotelian view. What really interests us on a properly deep ecological level is the way that that coconut in meeting my hand can express certain things like becoming hairy or becoming hard. And when it expresses becoming hairy, for example, it does so because of an ecological relation to the virtual. Um, the expression by the coconut of becoming hairy when it touches my hand um, is something which has the meaning of hairiness because it has relation to the idea in almost a platonic sense um, of hairiness in itself. But what is the idea of hairiness except a certain concentration of virtual intensities one concentration of those over another. We know this because there are certain ideas which are uh, antitheses of each other. They're um, antonyms, right? So uh, hairy is the opposite of bald. Hard is the opposite of soft. And these actually do exist, if you will, as ideas, not in a world of ideas beyond like Plato assumed, but rather in the realm of the virtual, in which one idea is different from another because it's a different concentration of those intensive powers. And the experience um, that I feel intensely myself, like say becoming jealous, um, is another example of this. It's a connection to the idea of jealousy, which is um, the antonym of the idea of trust, but I feel it so intensely in my jealous actions and words and thoughts because those are connected also to the raw power of those virtual intensities. So it's not that actual or identifiable objects don't exist for Deleuze. It's rather that they're always secondary and derived from the virtual realm, which always asymmetrically exceeds them. So what interests us about the schizo, to return to that, is that the schizo bypasses the actual identifiable structuration of the Oedipal by going uh, through a line of flight back to the virtual itself. And this is like capital because the schizo is able to reappropriate from the virtual certain intensities, which can then be reactualized um, into new things beyond what the Oedipal Triangle would have limited in advance um, for us to be able to think about. This is why it appears to be madness, because it is a kind of novelty which, in a very, very specific sense, emerges from going straight to the virtual in order to reactualize it, which actually is exactly what capital does. Capital for Deleuze and Guattari, and really I think for Nick Land and James Ellis, these other accelerationists, um, does exactly the same thing. Capitalism is defined by constant change, which we typically called progress, um, in which the thing which seemed to be the sublime object, a commodity, which you would have done anything, even robbing stores to steal the iPhone um, when it's brand new, like was uh, allowed in cities like Philadelphia uh, last month, um, is something which turns to garbage just a few years later, not even a few years. Uh, the, the iPhone that I used in America for several years is sitting outside my house in India now in the um, where I burned the garbage outside there um, with a cracked screen and looking as terrible as you could imagine. The thing really stopped working anyway after a few years when they intentionally want you to go out and get a new one. So we see that capitalism is defined by a constant change in which something seems so important that you're willing to steal. Well, until you find out that the iPhone 15 has problems with overheating. So uh, the person who uh, went through the trouble of stealing that, the hard work of stealing um, that phone later might have had their hand burned when they were trying to use it, um, which is uh, soon level of humor and irony to um, something which always happens within capital, which is the kind of constant change which we risk misunderstanding if we don't um, phrase it in the terms offered up by Deleuze and Guattari as really being the same thing as the schizo. Capital never reaches a final or completed state because it always has to go yet back again into the virtual in order to find new ways to appropriate 
from there to generate new kinds of productivity that have not yet been imagined. Okay, and this is what really uh, forces it to uh, not remain on the inside of the actual and identifiable in Kantian terms. This is the um, synthesis of the subject's coherent representations. Uh, it's always going back into the nominal realm, into the thing in itself, into um, the transcendental, right, as uh, James Ellis calls it. Uh, so we have this inability for capitalism to reach a final state uh, and to incorporate anything that challenges it on an ideological level for just that reason. If you've ever wondered why all of the challengers of global capitalism, even those who try to phrase it in environmentalist terms, which Kaczynski would maybe seem at the outset to agree with. So um, Greta Thunberg is a great example of somebody who uh, actually doesn't get that much attention now, but it was in 2019 she was speaking to the UN about how um, fossil fuels were bad for nature. Well, uh, Kaczynski certainly would not disagree with that. And yet, what was she doing speaking at the UN, except maybe being put into a position within the same system she was opposing precisely because global capitalism is compatible with anything that challenges it on an ideological level because those challenges are only dealing with actual and identifiable representations on the inside but do nothing to address how they emerge from the outside and therefore offer up the kind of novelty which can be reincorporated back into the actual from the virtual in a way that capitalism always already does. This is why all of the critiques of capitalism, which only focus on the actual and identifiable problems with it on an ideological level, are actually given a perverse incentive to keep up the critique because it gives new ways for the capitalist system to reappropriate them. So how, might you ask, is acceleration any different? Is acceleration just another ideological critique of capitalism which can be turned into a marketing niche for wealthy people as the um, UN uh, summits and uh, the uh, world leader gatherings to do something about fossil fuels damage to the environment are um, things which uh, the world's wealthiest uh, people uh, travel to by their own private jets. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio um, once got a reward, an environmentalist reward, um, in some foreign nation which he had to take a private jet to accept um, graciously without realizing the contradiction here. Because once again, capital is always able to reappropriate that kind of novelty because it is caught up in the same sort of passage into the virtual uh, bypassing the ideological structures of its day in really the same way that the schizo does with regard to the Oedipal Triangle. So how is acceleration going to be any different from this, one might legitimately ask. Well, this is where we find a very strange sort of common ground with Kaczynski himself. Now, before we could talk about the connection to Kaczynski, we should remember that James Ellis finished his um, essay on acceleration, which I did a video on on this channel back in March, uh, by noting that acceleration for him really means uh, understanding that man is immanentized into this through being possessed by the outside in the sense of the virtual, right, the noumenal. And for that reason, accelerating the process does not mean moving faster in time. It does not mean speeding up the process to reach the kind of future which Ray Kurzweil predicted in which, you know, for Ray Kurzweil, eventually the machines will become so smart that previously unsolvable problems like death itself will be no more. And what will we do with all of that time? We're forced to exist for eternity after being uploaded into uh, cyberspace to um, live as pleasure machines for which uh, our only concerns will be uh, what junk food we're going to binge on that day without uh, suffering any negative health consequences because it's a purely virtual simulation, gives us all of the pleasure and none of the pain, or uh, which uh, Bollywood actress we're going to have sex with the virtual simulation of that day in another um, strange uh, delivery of all of the pleasure without the pain, which Kurzweil assumes is going to be the end point of accelerating this process. So uh, people who uh, want that to arrive much sooner may seem to be accelerationists, but they're the exact opposite, because all of the things which Kurzweil is fighting for are just the ideological structurations of the inside, which 
the schizo and capital and the accelerationist will bypass to go straight to the virtuality which exceeds it. Isn't this what we're already trained to do? Aren't we already uh, trained to binge on junk food and to um, immerse ourselves in uh, technological simulations of sexual pleasure which aren't really real, which by the way is called pornography? Uh, these are the same things which are already there within ideological level on the inside and misses the point that the acceleration is all about going directly to the virtual outside, which exceeds that on a fundamental transcendental level. And acceleration really means just letting that outside in by getting closer, not to some predetermined singularity, which allows us to get what we're already getting, but in a much better form. Uh, rather, acceleration means getting close to the new as something which does not follow in a linear continuous level from what is already going on in a certain trajectory of technological advancements or upgrades, but rather entails a fundamental break from it. You need the uh, three syntheses of um, Deleuze's difference in repetition to understand this. The first synthesis simply constructs a passing present by folding the retention of a just past past into an expectation of what's going to happen in the future for Deleuze. Crucially, this is uh, something that is a passive synthesis rather than something performed actively by a Cartesian subject. So time passes in this naive sense of a passing present because that synthesis is silently going on in the background. The second synthesis, however, um, allows us to direct or steer or aim um, into a past that is directed towards a virtual idea rather than an actual identifiable object. If I remember um, the spiciness of a rye whiskey I drank in America 10 years ago, the rye whiskey is no longer present as an actual or identifiable object, but I can aim beyond it to the idea of spiciness. And that's what my memory is really doing at that time. And that is a different synthesis than the one that simply gives us a passing present. The third synthesis, though, is the one that aims not um, into a past to contemplate a virtual idea uh, through memory, uh, nor does it give us a passing present, but rather uh, takes us to the other um, sphere, if you will, of time, which is the future. But what is the future except um, a directedness towards the really new qua, the pure differences in themselves of the virtual, which once again um, takes us beyond the memory of an idea because an idea for Deleuze is just a specific concentration of intensities. The idea of spicy is different from the idea of sweet because those are different concentrations of intensity. But what about going beyond that to the realm of pure difference in itself? That's what the future is, but specifically a future that is not a continuation in a smoother linear manner of that passing present. Remember, that's the first synthesis. The future, the really new future is really new because it breaks that trajectory. And that's what acceleration is really about. Acceleration differs from naive uh, technological optimism because it doesn't predict that something we desire on a humanistic level today um, is going to arrive as the end point of so many technological advancements that linearly bring us closer and closer to it, for which, by the way, where did these desires come from except from the technological system itself? And the sort of junk food Ray Kurzweil wants to binge on are things we had to be taught to desire by corporate marketers and through the black ad, uh, black magic of advertising, etc. And so too with all of our other artificially constructed desires. We know that uh, these desires are artificial because um, the uh, rise of deepfakes within pornography a few years ago was something that made it into the news precisely because um, Gal Gadot had a video emerge of her um, that was indistinguishable from a real sex tape, even though it was actually uh, superimposed her face onto some other um, already existing pornographic video. You might remember this news story from, like, what, 2017? And um, they uh, kind of scratched the surface and found that uh, Gal Gadot uh, was one of, actually, the most targeted for this because she was not herself, but rather um, a window into a certain kind of subconscious fantasy which people had had for years because of their exposure to DC Comics. If you look at the most common uh, targets for deepfaking, they're actually just the characters from the epic film franchises which we grew up watching. Wonder Woman is one of them. Uh, Hermione Granger, ironically or bizarrely enough, uh, Emma Watson is another because people were reading Harry Potter and 
implanting these subconscious fantasies within the neurological realm at a fairly early age. So too with um, Natalie Portman as being another one who was, of course, just Queen Padme from Star Wars. And then Scarlett Johansson, the fourth one, according to one news article um, from uh, The Avengers, Black Widow. So we find this very strange sense that even when people are given the ability on a technological level to manufacture a subconscious fantasy into something which seems like the real thing, and they're allowed to do so privately in a kind of um, uh, anonymity for which no one will know um, that they had this fantasy because they're able to do it in such a way that no one will ever catch them. And yet, even under those conditions, they fall back on the same sort of cartoonish images which had been implanted into their subconscious at an early age from the film industry. You find in the deepest layers of the subconscious just the cartoonish images of Wonder Woman, um, Queen Padme, um, Black Widow, and Hermione Granger. And this shows why acceleration is not just finding upgrades to continue pushing a linear trajectory already started by the global technological system itself. It's rather taking the schizo line of flight outside of that structuration to find new ways to appropriate power from the realm of the virtual precisely because it's totally new and different from what had already been recognized as an actual or identifiable structuration on the inside. And this is actually where we find common ground with Kaczynski, of all people. Now, if we tie this back to Kaczynski, we'll find that... Um, his relation to acceleration really emerges from a certain apparent contradiction between two different ways that he describes modern technology in the Unabomber Manifesto. On the one hand, uh, he has the quote that uh, the technophiles are taking us on an utterly reckless ride into the unknown. But on the other hand, he argues that technology's problem is that it forces us to be too much known in advance because technology requires full predictability from anything incorporated into its system, in which case it's trying to eliminate any problem of the unknown. So how do we reconcile these two contradictory claims? Uh, technology is dangerous because it's taking us into an unknown future in which um, human extinction is certainly one possibility, but all the other unexpected problems of technology, unexpected side effects, are also things that... Uh, make the project for Kaczynski, anyway, not even worth attempting. Uh, the s side effects of uh, pushing that even further are things which we literally can't predict because that's the whole point of, say, complexity theory. Emergent properties uh, cannot be known even from a bulletproof analysis or understanding of the factors, uh, the parts um, from which they emerge. That's what makes them emergent properties. But on the other hand, uh, the problem with uh, technology is that it... Um, destroys our ability for even the kind of natural freedom to be creative enough to generate new thoughts which would be unknown from its standpoint. Insofar as you're allowed to think or act or consume or vote within modern technology, it's only if you do the things which the technological system already told you you were supposed to do through over-socialization. Well, this contradiction really needs acceleration because for Kaczynski, um, the the thing about technology is that it is not in and of itself uh, physical machines. So we might think that technologies are just the product of engineering uh, projects that uh, use scientific knowledge to create these machines that uh, could not have appeared within nature because they required that sort of intervention. And the difference between nature and technology on a naive standpoint is just the difference between a natural object like a, a deer in the wilderness uh, versus a technological object like a machine like the smartphone in your hand. Um, but really, the difference between the two is much more fundamental than that. Even the deer in the forest is forced to become technological if the wilderness stops being wildness, to use the terms from Kaczynski's 1972, I think, um, unpublished essay, Progress versus Wilderness, in which uh, can we really say that the national parks of America are really wilderness if um, the forest department um, has them so regulated that even if um, a, a hiker goes a little bit off the trail, there will be a rescue helicopter there to save them. And by the way, you can only uh, do things within that park um, if the system, the forestry department approves of it. And your main thing you do with nature at that point is just use it as a recreational campground to go away for the weekend to barbecue hot dogs, drink beer, and take pictures of yourself in front of a lake before you go back to your office job on Monday morning. So we have this idea that um, nature and technology would seem to be opposed in 
rough physical terms, like here's a technological object here, here's a natural object there, but really it's more complicated than that because anything under the control of a system that is hardwired to maximize predictability and efficiency through forcing things incorporated into it to act only in those ways that promote the advancement of the self-propagating system as a whole, that's what technology really is, in which case things that seem to be natural really are not if they're incorporated into it. Now, in contrast with this overemphasis on predictability, you have nature in its purest form as the emergence of the new because of the way that, say, evolution leads to things which humans perhaps could not have imagined. Uh, who could have imagined uh, something like the duckbill platypus? Who could have imagined marsupials um, as these uh, mammals with some pouches? And the things that um, people thought were um, urban legends when uh, British people or whatever went to Australia and brought back these stories, people assumed, no, no, that's got to be um, a, a myth or a fantasy. It can't really be the case that things like duckbill platypus and kangaroos exist in Australia, except that they do, because they emerged from nature... Um, I guess, going into the virtual to give us new structurations in the actual in a way that even people who consider themselves to be professional thinkers today really can't. It's not a coincidence that every film out of Hollywood today is a remake or the 10th sequel to a franchise started 10 years ago. They're going back to the 1980s to redraft the actors from that era like Tom Cruise to be the stars of films like Top Gun because there's no talent really within Hollywood today. Who's the, who's the best actress today? Rachel Zegler? Are you kidding me? Um, that is how far the standards of entertainment have dropped even as more money than ever before has been dumped into it. You think of the $300 million which Disney is going to lose on uh, the Snow White film, which is probably not even going to be released next year. So they're dumping more money than ever before into it, priding themselves on living in a technological society that is always coming up with totally new things never seen before, but those inventions are actually fully redundant. They're simply giving us more of what we're already used to. It. Um, nature is where you find that which is really new in the precise sense of going into the virtual to generate something new for um, the actual, and that's exactly what makes the accelerationist standpoint actually compatible with the anti-tech position because for Kaczynski the very transformation of an abstract idea or expectation of predictability into a physical thing that actually conforms to those requirements does not happen in a vacuum. The requirement is purely abstract or rational uh, but the object which conforms to it in the real world can only emerge through transforming raw material from nature into technology in a way that on the one hand satisfies the abstract requirement for predictability, but on the other hand negates it because of the emergence of emergent properties in line with set theory. So the more you convert nature into technology, just as it seems that the whole world is becoming more predictable, the risk of unpredictable side effects, even leading up to the mother of all of them, the one that, that could collapse the global technological system from its own contradictions, the closer you get to that point. So for Kaczynski, in a certain sense, he is an accelerationist because he talks about um, adding stress to the system rather than allowing people to be lulled into a state of mindless consumption over a whole lifetime in which they get so comfortable with their uh, heating in the winter and air conditioning in the summer and their favorite shows on television and their fast food um, and their private car that they don't feel like thinking more about the situation than they have to because they have actually grown quite attached to the comforts which technology, technological system allows them in the short term. Uh, Kaczynski doesn't want that state. He wants us to have to think about this, not because humans have um, any need to go around starting problems, but rather um, noticing that these problems are emerging on their own precisely because of this mismatch between the expectation for full predictability and the emergence of unpredictable side effects. And this is something which um, actually does have a parallel within Nick Land's work, because if you look at the essay Artist Insurrection, the fourth essay within Fang Nomina, he notes at the very beginning that artists are savage beasts because they can't get enough of too much, which is an interesting way of describing artists because 
Um, we normally contrast art and nature in the sense of literally those are the terms that Aristotle's text is translated into, right? Art is not just the creation of beautiful paintings or classical music, uh, but rather any sort of artificial, see that word again, artificial intervention um, that uses, say, human reasoning to cause things to come to appearance that would not have come to appearance on their own naturally, which is really more what fusis means in ancient Greek. So we already have this distinction between fusis and techne, or between nature and art, um, from a long philosophical tradition that is actually turned on its head. When Nick Lane says at the beginning of this that artists are the ones who are actually savage and the etymological sense that in French to this day sauvage simply means wild. It doesn't mean like out of control and dangerous, that's what we think savage means, but a really for French it's a more neutral description of anything which is wild in the literal sense of being from the forest. In uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, the first canto uses the word selva to talk about the dark wood or forest he's in and selvaja to describe the wild animals that block his path up to the where the light is shining on the hill because etymologically those are the same thing a wild animal is wild because it's from the forest which is why wald in german simply is the word for a forest in old english also that's um really the old old word for a forest forêt is french right so um in old english anglo-saxon texts um wild and wald have a very close etymological relation so we have this idea in modernity, that the forest is that which is beyond the village, but we don't live in villages as we did in the Middle Ages, and the forest isn't really wild. So where is the wild forest where artists live today? Well, it's just anything beyond the global technological system, not in the physical sense of beyond city limits, but in the rational sense of that which escapes the predictability requirements of systematization. So the thing about artists is they are producing things that do not meet the requirements of full rational understanding by the global technological system because that's the whole point of art. If you look at um, Kant's idea of genius, the genius is the one who doesn't work from rules to create great works of art because he just he or she just suffers a moment of inspiration to produce things which even they cannot explain afterwards. If um, you have the symphonies of Beethoven, you have the paintings of Van Gogh, you have the poetry of, of Wallace Stevens, even they can't explain how they made it or explain what they mean because that's the whole point. You have a reflective rather than determinative judgment. So genius is a certain excess beyond rationalization, which for Nick Land in that essay actually takes us back to the realm of nature and the animal, precisely because in the experience of the sublime, we feel a certain pain in not being able to schematize something extremely large, especially from nature like mountains, because reason is punishing the imagination at that moment, according to Nick Land. Um, reason says you should be able to do this. After all, you can look out at the sky at night and fit the universe into your mind is kind of how um, undergrads are taught Kant, the, the mind-blowing thesis that you can fit the whole universe because you're looking up at all these stars. You can fit the universe in your mind, um, but you can't schematize a really big thing with a nature that is sublime. So reason says we should be able to do this. Imagination can't, and it's punished by reason for being animal all too animal. But that's exactly where art takes place. Art is all about the harmonious free play of the faculties at a pre-understanding level. And that's exactly what ironically provides a common ground between art and nature and makes art a flashpoint where you have a certain ability to accelerate those intensities to go beyond the structurations of the inside to reach the virtuality and power of the outside. And that's exactly, I think, where you find the common ground between Kaczynski and Nick Land.